What's up, guys? A special, and I truly do mean a special edition <laughs> of the On The Mic podcast. Uh, you see it in his background. DraftKings, PFL playoffs, where, where the champions are set, the championships are set. You see him on every PFL broadcast. You see him all over ESPN. And when I reached out, he was like, sometimes I learn in this sports broadcasting world, all you got to do is ask. And I finally just asked. And here he is, the one and only Ian Parker, the duck. I love that shirt, by the way. I absolutely love Sure. I gotta, I gotta get you one of these. I, that, <laughs> I, no. yeah, I, I will definitely uh, represent, man. I've you know. long known you for quite some time and uh, been a fan of all that you do. And man, first and foremost, thank you for making the time. Oh no! Listen, we've known each other for quite some time. I'm happy you asked. I, I, I love doing interviews and giving back, however I can, to help anyone else who's ever supported me. You've always been a great supporter of mine, Mike. So I'm, I'm happy to do it. It's always fun as I. You know, the uh, my girlfriend and I, as I try to get her more and more into MMA, it's always like <laughs> the Leo meme, right? Where every time I see you, I'm like, yo, that's my guy. That's my guy. That's my guy. Uh, and uh, no, man, it's just, it's nice because this MMA community, in my opinion, is far too negative. Now, we may talk about some negative things today. It's far too negative, but also it's like everyone's in their own lane. And in a weird way, I think that's what I respect about you. I've never seen you get caught up like off camera. We could talk about MMA media craziness <laughs> and you'd be like, I don't even know about half of this. And, and that's what I love. You just stay in your lane. But first and foremost, how did you get involved into the crazy world of sports betting? We'll start with sports betting. Sure. Um, when I was, uh, when I was really young, uh, my buddy, Mike and I, who's been one of my best friends for about 30 something years, his father and I used to get together on Sundays. We'd watch football. They'd be placing bets. They would have us literally draw like on a chalkboard or the marker board, whatever, the whiteboard, uh, their parlays, their plays. We didn't understand what they were talking about. They'd be making calls to bookies, all this stuff. And it was, uh, it was just kind of like hearing this. And over the years, we started to understand. And as years went on, you know, you go to college and your friends start betting on football and all these other sports. Once... MMA started really getting popular. Uh, you know, Forrest Griffin and Stefan Bonner was a very big tone setter that kind of lifted the sport back up. You know, Dana did a great job with just bringing that to light. But once MMA really started getting there and you were able to bet on it, I was finding it to be way easier than football and baseball and everything you could possibly think of because up until like now-ish, they weren't the fights weren't as competitive per se. Champions lasted a lot longer and Vegas and books just didn't know how to, how to do this. And especially with parlays, you were making a lot of money doing that. I, I can tell you that one of the biggest uh, bets I ever made and that I won was Max Holloway against Brian Ortega. Uh, when they fought where Max was showing him how to strike in round four, Max Holloway was only a minus minus one twenty. You go back and look at that. He should have been a minus 800. So it, it took, you know, I've always been involved around the space. I've always had friends who've enjoyed betting, Nothing with crazy amounts when I was younger, but once MMA allowed it and once it became a thing, I was like, you know what? Maybe this is my lane with my knowledge of betting in general to cement myself in the sport because I've been around the sport who, for probably around 15 to 20 years, one way or another. And I always said to myself, I got to find a way to make it permanent. I got to find a way to create my own lane because if you want to be a, like a color commentator, it, it's a great dream but you see who they have in place, right? Across the board, any organization. It, it, there's not a lot of spots there. So for me, this was my path to get to where I wanted to be and make it a dream come true with ESPN and the PFL. And it's it's been wild. And you, you've done a great job, you and Jonathan Coach on the PFL broadcast. All right, so you're going to find out a few things about me during this podcast. Uh, the first one that I'll just tell the world, I'm always broke and I'm very cheap when I bet. So um, <laughs> I don't bet often. And to be honest, I'm very, very weird about betting on fights, right? Because I sure. do take this serious. Uh, I tend to have this habit, especially early on when I was interviewing fighters. I Maybe I interviewed a fighter who was like plus 200. I, you know, I would do what someone like myself who's emotionally attached would be like, I can see the path. And they said something that it just sounds so good. So I'm going to start before I, you know, show how dumb I am. I'm going to ask this. <laughs> I've always said to people, I'm almost like the opposite of Ian Parker, right? Because I've always said to people, man, I don't know. I know their skill set and I know their opponent's skill set. But I also know one thing's for certain. 
a fight is a fight. And talking to you today, it's almost like a godsend because we had three major upsets on Dana White's contender series last night, including possibly the biggest we've ever seen. And it was like, oh my God, I finally have some like factual proof to stand on. You know, a, a fight is a fight. And m most of the time, the odds on favorites are going to win. That's not always the case in any sport, but one punch can change everything. A fighter may may wake up not feeling right. For me, it's a little different than saying, ah, the Lakers are going to lose to the Charlotte Hornets or the Chiefs are going to lose to the Las Vegas Raiders. With that mindset, or maybe can you talk to me about how stupid that mindset is of, hey, I just don't know because I feel every fight is 50-50, no matter what the odds are given. Uh, it's not a stupid mindset. Uh, you know, since I don't do a show yet for the Contender Series, people will write to me on Twitter. One guy wrote yesterday, like, what, what do you like? And I said, it's just way too chalky. The odds are just so wide that it's not even worth it any way, shape, or form. So I said to him, you could take a shot at Clark and Bashy inside the distance. One, you know, Clark was the one that lost. That was the biggest favorite on the card. Bashy, the second favorite, won inside the distance. However, by doing it that way, had you bet it that way, you would have still been profitable because Clark inside the distance, or or if you would have taken it by TKO, I think a lot of people were leaning that way with her. That was at plus odds. And even if you did it inside the distance, it wouldn't, if anything, would have been like a minus 130. So you wouldn't really have lost um, a whole lot there. But when you were looking at the contender series, so with your mindset, I'm going to try to answer this directly towards how you're asking the question, right? You have to also look based on the levels of competition. And that's no disrespect to the contender series, but for the contender series, these are supposed to be the top of the line prospects trying to get into the UFC. Right. So in that situation, you have to look at the level there. Clark, as good as she might have been, you know, in LFA, whatever it is, minus 1100 against somebody that if you looked at what her opponent's stats were, it was like all knockouts in round one. You knew someone was going to sleep one way or the other. So to your point, when it comes to a contender series thing like that, I would say it's more towards a coin flip. Yeah. Because when you're fighting on the regional scene, you never know. A lot of these guys have trouble getting fights. Uh, the guy Santos who won last night, people were talking about his level of competition. He's only fought cans. From what I heard, as true as that may be, he's had a lot of trouble finding top-level competition who is willing to find him on the regional scene where he is. And then look what he did. He went in last night, and you know, I think he was a 4-1 to one underdog, and he won 30-27 across the board. So when you're looking at the contender series, I always say tread lightly. The odds are very wide. These are still prospects in the, the day. Now, when it comes to the UFC or PFL, a little bit of a different story. That's where those bigger favorites, most of the time that doesn't happen. But to your point, it is MMA. They're wearing four ounce gloves. It's still men and women. You can land anywhere on the jawline. It doesn't matter if you're a minus 10,000 favorite, you can still get knocked out. But you know what, man? The, the old saying on any given Sunday, right? With football, anything can happen. It's like that in any sport. You just got to learn how to really mitigate risk or find your angles on how to get it done without risking so much on those big favorites. Yeah, and I think that's a key, right? And let's speak specifically to the PFL. And, sure. And, you know, for I think a lot of the criticism when it comes to your side, and you could tell me, I'm just saying what I see on social media and all that, <laughs> is that the matchup and the matchmaking, I should say, in the PFL, there's just a lot of heavy, heavy favorites, especially on the gambling side. So, well, the first answer is just listen to Ian Parker, and that's how you make money. You know, <laughs> the second part is if you're a first-time PFL better, you know, you're like, well, I've got nothing but favorites to pick. How how does one maybe novice come into a PFL playoff situation or most PFL matchups and become profitable? Well, that's a two-parter, right? So let's address the betting aspect of it first. So if you watch my show with Coachman and we do, you know, a podcast for the PFL that's on ESPN Plus that we do the betting pre-show because in the beginning, we try to get on odds when they come out earlier in the week. Then we do different bets or add on to what we've already given out on the live show. I give out a lot of method of victory. I do a lot of over-unders and I try to parlay. And, you know, really... People tend to, I think, have a little bit of a false narrative towards the PFL with that. Because if you look at the UFC, most of the time, the odds are not that different. I mean, if you look last, uh, what was it? Not last week, we went dark the week before. You had a minus 900. You had a, you know, you had a minus 700 in Zach Reese, the minus 900 in the Kong Wang fight. You had a minus 400 uh, on another fight. So it's going to happen, 
right? You can't always get such you know great odds. I mean, even Kyle Bahio over Jared Kamier, he ended up being a minus 250 at one point. That's still a pretty big number for a main event when you're talking about guys within the top five, right? So with the PFL, I urge you to pay attention to what I do because I will never give out a money line play above a minus 225 in, and in layman's terms over a two to one favorite. Too much to risk because it's MMA. I'll find a different way to do it, whether it's a method of victory. For example, we had Brendan Locke name. It was minus 350. We give out him to win by decision over Kai Kamaka. It was only minus 120. So I reduced that number by a three to one, and we got the win with risking a lot less. Uh, we we did that quite a few times throughout the entire season. And I mean, Impa over, over Josh Silvera, Impa by decision. It, it was just something that you, you try to find. You also have to understand the PFL format, right? In the first round, everyone's trying to get those six points, get the early finish. In round two, you got to see who just needs a win to get in, who needs to not just get finished, and who needs a first round finish. In order then to bet your over-unders and who to take and how to do your method of victory. But then once you get to the playoffs, you can kind of take a deep breath and settle in and go back to understanding the fighters and their matchups. Because at that point, it's not about a sense of urgency. It's about winning and trying to do it without getting too banged up so you're not too injured for your next fight and then to go on to the championship. Uh, in regards to matchmaking, that was your other question, right? Yeah. You know, I think people like to just be negative instead of really taking a deep breath and understanding, you know, not everything has to be compared to the UFC. And it's impossible to compare. Listen, the UFC is, is the Mecca. They're number one. The PFL doesn't have to be number one. That's not what they're trying to do. It's not what they should try to do. It should be, we want to be the best MMA organization on planet Earth on Thursday or Friday night on ESPN that can sell pay-per-views and they don't have to compete with the UFC. They can coexist. It's just like pro wrestling. They had WWE, they had WCW, they had ECW. There was enough to go around. You don't have to love one over the other. Their, their, um, their broadcasts are never at the same time, so you don't have to choose. So people kind of look at it in the wrong way, like, oh, they got to do this, they got to do that. Well, like, like I mentioned before, if you look at some of the Apex cards, a lot of them are very lopsided with favorites, and sometimes the fights turn out to be really solid. Uh, with the PFL, the way they set it up in the format, after round one and round two, per se, once the playoffs happen, they fall into onto their own based on seeding. If you're looking at the undercard with matchups, you know, they're still prospects. I mean, Fat Gene a few weeks ago was a minus 500. He won by split decision. I mean, <laughs> you know, it, it's it's MMA. So instead of looking at this, you know, and, and then the other one was um, that gentleman who's going to be in uh, PFL Africa, who was on early in the card. He beat another season MMA vet. He smashed him, and everyone was like, oh, man, I hate this lopsided matchup. But the guy from Africa who won, who looked pretty good, he was only, I think, 8-2 and two was his record against a guy who's 13-5. and five. So, you know, people like to just, instead of sitting there and look at it as like, oh, this guy's pretty cool. I never heard of him before. PFL may have found someone as, oh, I can't stand these matchups. They're so lopsided. What is the PFL doing? Guys, UFC does it all the time too. And no one, no one's doing it to get people smashed. You know, it's hard sometimes to find matchups for prospects. And there's sometimes the availability is not as crazy as it seems. And you could tell by how some of these fights go. Sometimes these favorites that come in off the street. I mean, how many times you've been around MMA? How many times are these records padded, you yeah. know, from other countries? And sometimes, yeah. sometimes they're the real deal. I mean, the uh, the young kid who fought Umar Namagamedov. On his on his first fight, why was why was nobody be like, oh my god, he's minus you know seventeen hundred? What are we doing here? Yet the kid went all three rounds with Umar, yep. right? But I guarantee yep. you, if Umar would have smashed him, people wouldn't have said squat because it's the UFC, and that's okay. My whole thing is, if you're an MMA fan, try to find the positive. And if there's something you don't like about it, I know people complain about the PFL pacing in between fights. Guys, last, two weeks ago at the UFC, the same thing happened. They had, you know, in the contender series, had a lot of spacing last night between the finals. People don't understand the broadcast part of it, right? They don't understand the sponsorship deals, the commercials sometimes. But things like that, you can voice your opinion without being so negative and trying to bash your organization because I can guarantee you there's been a lot of fun PFL cards on a Thursday or Friday night when you had no MMA. So what would you rather? Would you rather no MMA or would you rather some really potentially fun fights because the PFL 
And I'm not just saying this because I work for them, because you know I work for ESPN. I cover UFC. I'm the biggest MMA fan on planet Earth. So I, I love that, that I'm literally the only person that gets to cover every organization, right? It's kind of crazy. Um, PFL's got some guys that you can go to the UFC and compete within the top 10 in almost all the divisions. It's not even a question. Just got to get that whole brand thing out of sight. It doesn't always have to be one versus the other. Right. Yeah. I think that's the the hard narrative in, in a lot of these sports, but mainly in combat sports, you know, for those that don't know, and you know, this is our first time talking on camera, you know, I came from the world of covering the NFL and the NBA in China. Sure. So even like, I've heard all the time, like, oh, your line of questioning is different. It's like, yeah, because a guy like I look up to and I've mentioned him all the time, even though we don't talk is like, I'm not a Luke Thomas, right? I'm not going to be able to sit here and talk about the, the technical side of the sport because I haven't been training MMA for 15 years. But if on the human interest side, I can make someone more interested in a Clay Collard or, you know, a Jenna Bishop or some Josh Silvera, right? And, sure. and we'll, get, we'll get into that side of the PFL because that is a conversation I want to have. But I, I really also wanted to talk to you just sports gambling because, well, number yeah. one, uh, I just finished the Pete Rose documentary, and I think he had the greatest line any better should have. My uncle pointed it out to me, and I think he was like, I'm paraphrasing, but it was something along the lines of, if you show me someone who's a gambler, they're not usually a winner. And it's like – yeah, <laughs> it's like, that's very, <laughs> especially. It's, it, <laughs> look, it's, it's, it, 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 that's because when you get so, you know, it, it, it's a, it's a, <laughs> he's not wrong, right? So I'll, I'll get, I'm going to give you a perfect example to Pete Rose and I'll, I'll dedicate this one to him. So when I do my show, Best Bets on ESPN, people like to go on Twitter and they like to troll and say, oh, Ian had a bad night. Ian didn't do this. And they literally will write, a percentage of my main card picks, a percentage of my prelim picks for the entire year. And sometimes, and, and I don't address trolls because it's just not worth the time. I, I rather give my attention and, and, and back and forth to those that are supportive. Or if there's a disagreement, I, I'm open to friendly, respectful debates on Twitter all the time. You know, uh, I'm not always right. So I have no problem in hearing other people's opinions. But when people do that, right, I'm sitting there going, Someone took the time out of their day to play into that quote per se, right? That Ian, who's the betting expert for ESPN, is giving out all these picks per card. That's not how it goes. So if, you, if you're taking the time to post about me in a negative light, right, through that type of quote, I'm anti that quote, meaning I'm trying to prevent people from living that quote. And where I'm getting with this is on my show. I do leans for every single fight, right? Because everybody wants an opinion on the entire card. But there's a reason why we go best bets, parlay, props, and not every fight is listed. So when they're doing my percentages, like my actual real, it's based off of the best bets. It's based off the parlays and props, not off of every single pick. So I'm trying to prevent people from being the Pete Rose quote, right? So if I'm giving you, hey, my best bets, these are the ones I suggest you put your money on. The parlay, this, the long shot, don't go crazy. A little something for fun that, you know, you won't cry if you lose type of thing. But if you hit it, go celebrate with your family. That's how you don't fall into that quote. But why he's saying that is because when people win, it's never enough, right? But with losing, it's I could always try and get it back. Yeah. So, so that's what he's saying. He's saying that, it's, you know, most people can't just get up from the table and walk away with their chips. Most feel like, all right, I'm here. How can I take it a step further? It's almost like the number is never enough, right? So Pete Rose, unfortunately, <laughs> learned that one the hard way yeah. with what he did. But my job is not just giving out, trying to give out winners as best as I can. It's also trying to give people the discipline and how to do it. Because when we first started the show, I was giving out a, a bet for every single fight. And after a few weeks, my producer and I were like, this is kind of silly. It's impossible to have a winning record doing it that way. 12 to 13 fights each week. Odds are all over the place, you know? So that's when I was like, you know what? We're going to give out our best ones or this or that. So, you know, I'm trying to prevent people from falling into that whole, you know, the gamblers never win thing. I'm trying to have the ones where at least the gamblers are able to have fun while winning and try to reduce their risk of losing as best as possible. 
I currently reside in Missouri, which I don't, I'm not going to speak on the state laws of no sports gambling, but they should hurry the hell up and, and change that. Uh, <laughs> previously, uh, having lived in Chicago, I also worked in uh, these like slot bars. So very sure. much a mini bar with just slot machines. And I learned the Pete Rose quote firsthand. You know, I'll never forget a Saturday right after work. I jumped on the machine and I was up like 150 and like, for those who are like, why is this guy talking about betting when he's the most broke person we know? I bet we'll, we'll talk about sports betting, but like <laughs> on sports betting, I bet like two, three bucks every parlay just to just to make everything more fun, right? Like there's a baseball and, game on tonight. I don't really <laughs> care, but Mike, I, but that's no, but but Mike, that's but here's the thing though, right? You are someone that's in the bigger percentage, you know, and that's a and that's a not a bad thing, right? That, so. Betting's not supposed to be stressful, you know, <laughs> it's supposed, I mean, it's stressful because even if it's a dollar or whatever it is, right? right. But what I have found is more people are like you than they are like some of the bigger gamblers that I speak with that throw down five, 10, 15, 20, $30,000 a fight and chase these big whale plays, hoping to get rich quick. When a lot of people are more like yourself. One, two, three, four, five dollars on a long shot, five to win a thousand. And if you lose, it's like, all right, but if you win, it's like, yo, this was awesome. There's so many ways to do it where it doesn't have to be, you know, like, oh man, can't believe this. What am I doing? You know, it, it doesn't have to be that way per se. Um, people go through it though. You know, there are strings of bad luck at the end of the day, you know, and I don't think anyone purposely tries to dig themselves, but for someone like yourself, there is nothing wrong with um, betting it that way. That that's fun, you know. That that's why, you know. I'll quote my mentor, Jonathan Coachman: Enter, "Educate and entertain." You know, we try to be fun with it. At the same time, we try to educate how to really bet this sport uh, specifically without getting crazy. You know, sometimes people chase long shot parlays and they throw a lot of money on it. And for every thousand they do, they may hit one, and that and that's cool. For me. I don't do long shots to that extent. I will do more where it's like 25 or 50 bucks to win 20,000 because that's, that's okay. But that is why we always break down the odds. We try to, you know, limit people from betting these minus 300s on the money line. Those scare me more than anything. You know, when I see people giving out those type of plays, those frighten me because that one loss knocks you out for the rest of the card. Then you're just playing catch up and should never have to be that way. Uh, let me ask you this, uh, transition well, away from combat sports. Are you good? Uh, well, when I knew I was getting this interview with you, I was like, I don't want to be insulting. But as I'm now covering MMA and uh, partially NFL and on the podcast side, a lot of NFL stuff, you know, I'm trying to do a video a day basically about either the NFL or something in sports. I started thinking, well, you know, this weekend it's week one in the NFL. We've had two weeks of college football which I absolutely hate because people tell me not to take Travis Hunt and three touchdowns against North Dakota state. However, uh, I was like, how do I like try to enter a space that maybe I'm not fit for, but it creates more content, but I don't want to be that guy. Right. So if someone like myself is thinking about starting up, Hey, I'm going to give picks, but I don't want to be the Ian Parker of the NFL. Like I'm not looking to do that. Right. But I may, I I may, I'm, I've been thinking this week about kind of curtailing it with like, kind of a, uh, like a warning, right? Like a, Hey, don't like come back at me. Not that I can't take the heat, but th this is my upset parlay of the week, or this is, you know, kind of like what you guys do. This is my best bet, you know, props of the NFL this week, kind of curtailing it to fit certain molds inside the NFL. Cause before I finish that, I will say this, I'm under this personal belief. It's just me personally. Everyone's got their own kind of way of sports betting. I almost have now refused, especially after 2024, to bet on anything where I don't feel matters can be taken into an athlete's hands. Meaning, I hate betting baseball and I hate betting hockey. And I'm sure there are plenty of people out there that go, well, yeah, you're just a loser. That's why you hate it. And that might be very true. But if there's another instrument involved in the production of the sport, you know, Mookie Betts can't say, I'm going to supercharge this bat and hit three home runs. But if I need LeBron James to have 37 points and the Lakers are around 13 and he's only got 20, I still feel pretty good about that. 
because he can take the game into his hand into his hands. Same thing with the with the NFL. Almost the same thing with combat sports. Um, going back to all of that, if someone like myself wanted to start doing NFL picks, should I have that precursor, that kind of warning label of hey, I'm only going to do it this way? Don't look at me for all these picks because I, I specifically want to look at upsets of the week or props of the week and stuff like that. Well, you know, how I would recommend doing it, if this is something you truly want to do, is I would just do a no more than a 90-second video, give out one or two plays, give your reason why. You don't need a precursor. You don't need to put up a waiver. Just put yourself out there, post the video, and hope for the best. But, you know, and if, and if it hits, cool. If it doesn't, be transparent with the losses and just be consistent with it. You know, that that's something that in the beginning, you know, Jonathan Coachman – Still to this day, I'm not great at getting videos up, giving my opinions on things, trying to show the world that I'm not just, you know, the betting guy. I could be an analyst, all that good stuff, that I'm well-versed in this sport altogether. For you, though, if you're trying to go into a little bit of a different territory that you're not known for, make yourself known. But you got to start from zero, right? What does that mean? Use Twitter, use Instagram, whatever platform you're more comfortable on. Make a 90-second video. Do your upset of the week. Give a reason why. Post it. That's all you got to do. And then just build on that. And if it, and if it hits or, and becomes a thing and you're enjoying doing it, you know, take it to the next step. Because look, at the end of the day, there is going to be a million people trying to do that too, right? You're not the first one who's creating it, but you're the only you. And you have a following through MMA, through what you've done in the NBA and stuff like that. So if you want to cross over and make the content you want, then just make the content you want. You know, if you're putting it out there, then it's out there. If, if you don't do it, nothing will happen. If you do something, you're giving yourself an opportunity to do it. I love that answer, man. And I, and I appreciate that. Cause it's one of those things where it's like, all right, I'm not trying to get like torched, you know, but honestly, I don't, I, I really, truthfully, I don't care, you know, to be honest with you. Because well, that, well, look, look at the end of the day, here's what I will tell you, right? More, uh, we live in a world, unfortunately, where people will sit behind their computer and they think that they could always do your job better than you. And instead of putting in the work, instead of going down and navigating the right channels, they rather type away on how much you suck or how much you don't know this. I've gotten so many times, there was, listen, there are so many comments on the YouTube channel when we do our show about like, oh, how, how is he picking Tom Aspinall to beat Curtis Blake? Like I've gotten some crazy ones about prior to and then afterwards, it's like, oh, okay, he did this. You know, it's it's like people rather go in there and be negative. So like, it's good that you don't care because you can't care. You you can't you can't. If unless someone said to me, hey, is there a way you could address this type of bet differently, or if you could approach this format, you know, I don't mind constructive criticism, how to make the show better, or if there's something I can do better to appeal to fans. But when people want to question my knowledge, which is that one cracks me up, or when they say, how could he do this? And then afterwards, it's like, when it hits, now where'd you go, right? But I, I, I don't need, you know, John6578 with a dog avatar as his pictures validation for me to know where my success is and how I got to where, where I am now and how I'm going to keep going. And I'm just bleeding, Mike, I'm just getting started. I'm looking, you know, this space is mine and I'm enjoying every second of it. And I'm working harder every single day to keep getting better, keep putting up good numbers. Obviously it's betting. There are weeks I've not done good. There's weeks I've done incredible, but when it comes to this space, you know, a lot of people rather be negative and they think that they're going to do something to your job. I mean, look, one thing about Yanni, the Greek, I give it incredible, incredible credit for is guy takes a beating online and he just smiles and marches forward and does his thing. And the one thing I've learned is that I can go, I can have a sweep and be perfect on the card and someone will find something negative to say. So put, do your content, give your football picks. It's always going to be too hot in the kitchen, bro. People are always going to throw heat. Those that aren't in your position. And I'm not even saying that people want our spots or are so insecure. It's just, I never really understood the trolling thing. Um, I never okay. understood, you know, taking time to be, negative on social media because if you go and look at my social media whenever people have questions or if they disagree i respond back almost 100 percent of the time i don't know too many people in my position where i work that do that at all who take the time to 
Uh, I promised myself if I ever got to this level, I would never change, no matter how big of a following I could possibly reach. But when it comes to the troll stuff, that one, I have no problem hitting a block button. And it's not because I'm worried about someone calling out a bad pick. It's because I just don't deal with trolls. It's a waste of time. And in this space, the more popular you get, they're there. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. Well, and that's the thing, right? And I think you would attest to this. No one's telling John, right, to put his mortgage on whatever you know no one's telling you like and i think look, that's you, the one thing I, yeah look i tell people you could use this and then make your own picks however you want to do it i'm not forcing you to follow me or tell me if you disagree with me that's okay right. do whatever you want to do i'm giving you advice based off my knowledge there are sometimes people say wow i didn't even think of this type of play within a fight whether it's an over or the type of method or something and an over to get odds down. You know, people don't understand. I'm not just going on there picking minus 400's money line. I can't do that, nor would I do that. I have to find a way to make these plays make sense to help people win money if they take my help or people that want my knowledge or my opinion on things. So for example, like Raul Rojas Jr. in his last fight, I, instead of betting minus 700 or a parlay, I said, listen, he's either going to win one or two ways, right? You think he's either going to win by sub or decision, because you're thinking Ricky Tercios is durable, doesn't get finished. And we know Rojas is a beast on the ground. So I gave out a play, Rojas in over one and a half. It missed by four seconds. Okay. That was a minus 110 instead of a minus 700. So if anyone wants to come at me over four seconds, okay. <laughs> you know? right. exactly. for, for me, For me, I thought that was actually pretty creative. On because I didn't see anyone. I'm not saying that people don't give out these plays. Again, I'm not reinventing the wheel here, but one thing I'm known for is my creat creativity and finding different angles and thinking of ways to get these numbers down. Because keep in mind, I I'm, I'm on a very solid platform here. I'm exposed. I have to, there's, there's no hiding behind the camera. There's no hiding behind the keyboard. I can't just erase a pick if it loses and nor would I ever do that. But People thinking, oh, I could go out and give favorites. Oh, I could pick these winners every week. Oh, I could do why don't some guy who looks like he literally, I, I don't even want to like be mean, but like this guy who looked like he had no business, like, oh, we should you and me in a pickoff. I bet you I do better than you. And I'm just like, what is what is what is this? Zoolander with a walk-off? I don't even do a pickoff. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, I'm like, dude, that's great that you picked the main event guy to win. He was minus 500. Did you pick him by the exact method of victory? Did you pick the over or the under? You know. This this space for me, I love it. I love the fans that have supported me. Uh, I think, like you said, the one thing about me that you have not seen, I hope you never see, I don't have beef with anybody in the space. Right. I have a good rep. I'm I'm friends with a lot of people. It's very hard becoming good friends with fighters because then bias. I do my best not to be biased. You know, Bilal Muhammad's a very good friend of mine. And in that fight against Leon, I picked the over. I gave out the over. It was no disrespect to him. You know, I said, you know, and he even made a comment. He's like, oh, you don't think I'm finishing Leon? I said, you're not known for your finishing. <laughs> you know? right. I said, I and then I said, I think very much you could win this fight. And I gave the break on how he could win, but I'm also not going to sit there and, you know, put, you know, as a fan be biased because that goes against everything I stand for with the job. You know, it's, it's not show friends it's show business. And when it comes to that part of it, it's hard. I mean, think about every time I have to break down an Anthony Smith fight, he's a colleague. It's yeah. not easy, yeah. you know, guys like Chris Weidman, you know, my history with him, very, he's like family, not easy, you know, especially at this point in his career where you really don't know if his body's going to hold up, even though he's done since that leg break, he has shown unbelievable toughness and durability and he's still, you know, he's still fighting and I love this next fight for him, but it, it, it's just, uh, people don't look at the actual details of what I have to do my job. I think it's just picking winners. They don't look at the research I have to do. They don't have to realize I'm putting myself out there giving these plays to people. It's not like if you sit there by yourself at home, right? And you have a really bad night. That's just you on you. But if I have a really bad night, I, gave, I, I caused a lot of people to have a bad night. And if I have a great night, a lot of people are happy, right? I live, you want to call it the upside down. I live in that upside down between Tuesday Contender Series, Thursday, Friday, Bellator, PFL, Saturday, UFC. You know, people want my opinion on LFA, Cage Warriors, PFL, Mena, Africa, you know. So it, the list goes on and on, right? But it, it is not the easiest job, but I love it. And I think I'm doing a pretty decent job for both organizations. And 
you know, the more that betting becomes more popular, as you notice, we're getting like spreads now, right? I gave out, now it's been around for a few months. I gave out my first uh, PFL spread and Sean O'Connell was like, I can't believe there's spreads in MMA. And, but that's because the sport is growing and it has to be treated like every other sport. And that is, that's included in the betting space. So the more options we get, the more creative I could be, the more fun it's going to be. And hopefully we just keep producing a winning percentage. And I don't want to keep you too much longer. Just got to good. Uh, one thing that stands out to me and see, this is what I love, right? Because I'm just as much of a fan of MMA as I am someone who covers MMA. Right. And you and I could talk MMA for hours. So <laughs> I'm coming out of left field with these other questions is because to kind of put sports betting under the same umbrella. Right. But we're going to see, I believe it was the number was 35 billion in projected betting in the NFL this season. That is, first of all, mind-blowing to me. Secondly, I'm going to go kind of off the road here and just say behind you, and we see it on the broadcast, you know, the work you do at DraftKings. I can't make, and I'm not in any way sponsored or work with DraftKings, but I have to say this for everyone because I have people in my family who just bet here and there, and I'm not going to call out other sports books. But when it comes to DraftKings, it is the most user-friendly, whether you think you know what you're doing, you want help for what you you think you know you're doing, or you have no idea what you're doing, especially if you're looking at let's we're talking on Wednesday. If we're gonna look at Thursday night's NFL season opener between between the Chiefs and the Ravens, other sports books, they may have one spicy special for you, but no one like DraftKings puts together the the same amount of here are you're a Chiefs fan and you want to bet for the first time. Here's a five leg parlay. All Chiefs go have fun. If, same thing with the Ravens, so on and so forth. Right? I think DraftKings does the absolute best with that. But let's well, go back. Go well, ahead. hold on. So here's the thing. I'm at, believe it or not. So you know, DraftKings works with the PFL. I'm actually, and as you've seen, I work with ESPN. ESPN Bet. And with e, I, I will say this. Um, from what I, because I can't use DraftKings where I am. I'm in Florida, right? When I'm outside the state, uh, when I can, I've had good experiences. I, I will, I will say this. I think all the books at some point will be on the same playing field. I could tell you that ESPN Bet had to really kick it into hyper gear because that deal with you know the Barcelona sports book uh, turning into ESPN Bet became all you know just hyper speed, right? I, I, I think when you're looking at books. What I try to tell people is do with the shop numbers, right? Because DraftKings and FanDuel clearly are the two bigger names. They've been around. So they're the ones who are getting all same game parlay and putting out these crazy props and stuff. These other books will get there. I can tell you, and I'm not just saying this because I work for them, but ESPN Bet, those guys behind the scenes, they're working so hard to try and get it up to speed with everybody else. You know, they're, they're legal. I think it's in 17 states. They'll, they'll get there depending on how, you know, what their ultimate goal is. But, you know, we, they do a lot of, they've been very cool with bringing me in on the MMA side, trying to offer some good boosts. I know with Joe Fortenbow and with Aaron Dolan and with Tyler and Stephen A. Smith and Scott Van Pelt, they're using all of us that are on the forefront face wise and offering boosts per their perspective sport for a reason. So I, I think DraftKings, what they started, it's starting to trickle down everywhere else because i'm not sponsored by them i yeah you know i like i said i work for espn espn bet is my is my home with them they just happen to have the deal with pfl and it's it's you know like i've had a good experience with them as well so far so it's been cool yeah no and that's no no disrespect to you know no ESPN. you're you're good i just i just wanted to point out that because a lot of people can't you know some can't use DraftKings, right, right. so in, in that situation whether it's FanDuel or espn bet you know i I'm, i've never even used FanDuel before not oh, once wow. in my life. I've never had a chance to, you know, and not, not negative towards them. It's just, um, I don't think I've been in it because I've lived in Florida for the last 14 years and hard rock live is the one that's available down here. And that's right. only been the last year. So it's sports betting still getting out there. Uh, you know, so if, you know, whatever book you use shop, the best numbers, uh, you know, but to your point, yeah, DraftKings is user is very user friendly. And I think because of them, that trickle down effect will happen for everybody. Let's go back to that 35 billion in, in football. It's <laughs> absolutely mind blowing. Uh, what do you think attributes the most to that? Right. Is it the popularity of football, the rising popularity of sports betting, 
both put together, like what do you think attributes to $35 billion in projected money that will be uh, wagered on the NFL this season? The availability to do it just in the palm of your hand whenever you want. It, it, it's such a big difference between people having to go to a sports book and put their money down. I mean, people can literally be at the game. All they got to do is pick up their phone, type in their login and password and make their plays, deposit, withdraw. I mean, it's it's become so easily, yeah, I guess that tangible. And that's what's really changed the game. I mean, two years ago, not every state was legal, right? So people were driving over, you know, <laughs> over state lines to place bets to come back. Um, I, I have guys who tweet at me, hey, I'm crossing, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be here for this event but I got to place the bets now because they don't have this sports book there. So it's, you know, I think like New Jersey might've been one of the first States, if I'm correct, that legalized it. I have a lot of friends that are new, you know, I'm from New York. A lot of friends that are New York giants fans that had to go to Jersey for the game. Same thing for the jets. And what do you think they would do? You know, <laughs> they would go there, place the bet and come back. You know, it's a, uh, Go, drive over to Atlantic City, whatever they had to do. So I, I truly believe that it's due to the fact of how accessible it is. I mean, the fact that you don't have, I mean, when, I, when I'm in Vegas, I see guys all the time, the sports books, I'll walk over there just to go say hi, do like a meet and greet thing through ESPN, whatever it is. And it's crazy, dude, because there's nobody in there because they have it on their phone. You know, in Vegas now, you, know, you can't use DraftKings in Vegas, but the other sports books that are there, they have the mobile app. So why go? Unless you want the experience and the vibe, which is cool. But if you don't, <laughs> game changer, without a doubt. Ian doesn't know my day-to-day -day life, but uh, <laughs> talking about going through state lines, I mean, thankfully, this part of Missouri that I'm in, Kansas is 10 minutes away. And... Yeah, see, <laughs> but, that's, but, that's, but that's what I'm saying, though. And that yeah. used to be a thing where a lot of people – you know, a lot of people were so loyal to their sports book that if they want, they would drive 45 minutes or an hour just to go do that. And now you don't, you don't have to do it. It's, it's just so easy to do. I, I really, I don't know if it's the increase in fandom of football. I think that football is going to be king no matter what you do. And the fact that it's just so easy to place a bet on your phone, people have been killing for it and now they have it. That's why you're seeing such an insane number. I, I could speak on that, you know, just from you know my own experience, you know, living in Chicago where almost every sports book was available, everything was available on my phone. There was a casino 20 minutes from my house, right? All of this stuff. And then I moved to Missouri where it's not legal. And now I'm coordinating my Sunday starting this week of, all right, all my fantasy lineups will be in by 9.30, 10 a.m. Yeah, outside of the questionable start sits, right? Or the injuries at 10.30, we're getting in the car and we're going – to Kansas, and then I'm going to take 20 minutes or whatever. We're going to cross state lines. I'm going to place my 12 o'clock, my 3 o'clock, and my Sunday night parlays. And if something goes bad or if something goes good, at halftime of any of those games, we're going to get back in the car and we're going to go because I'm very much known in football to chase the dragon. So, you know, it's one of those things where I'm like, man, last year when I was back home, I'm like, oh, man, I, I missed on these two AFC games. Let me just pull out my phone real quick. Uh, and that leads me to this question when where I'm at, right. There's so many, there's Kansas city, not too far. Oklahoma city's not too far away. Texas is right, you know, beneath me. Uh, when you have so many pro sports teams within a vicinity, do you believe these States that carry pro sports teams will all have legalized sports gambling sooner rather than later? Yeah. Yeah, it's such a revenue generator. Why not? And and the one thing these books, I believe that they are doing is I believe they are limiting people to what they can deposit and withdraw. You know, they're, they're look, at the end of the day, you're your own, you're up against yourself, right? In regards to discipline. But I know a lot of these books try to limit people with X amount of transactions per week or per month. So yes, they're all going to have it. Is it a little dangerous? Uh, the more accessible it becomes, it is what it is, but it would be crazy for them to not do it. You have these big sp pro sports teams. I mean, Texas is such a big state, heavy populated area with a million and one teams between Texas and um, University of Texas, Cowboys, <laughs> Texas. I mean, like, it's, 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 it's insane. So I would be shocked if, uh, if that wasn't the case. 
Yeah, it's just, it may, it doesn't make sense to me. You know, it's the joke. You know, I talked to my uncle back home. He's like, so you can buy weed in Missouri, but you got to place your sports bet in, in Kansas and you can't buy weed there. I'm like, yeah. He's like, man, I just don't get I just don't get it. And, you know, that's a conversation for a different day. Uh, to kind of put a bow on everything, though, uh, man, we were talking before this started just kind of about PFL, mainly PFL, not just Bellator, but that PFL format. One thing I wanted to kind of touch on with you is that PFL format, because you mentioned it earlier. Yeah, I think as someone, again, who has come from the sports radio world of covering all the, the major sports, that the PFL is so much closer with their format, which should be the key. You know, I I think the thing that maybe hurts them, in my opinion, sitting way back, is you don't get the opportunity for rivalries or character building, right? You don't, you're not going to get a guy like a Conor McGregor, who's the easiest example in the world, to come in and set the PFL on fire. But if you look at the season format and, and where guys like you mentioned Bilal Muhammad, I look at his coach, Lewis Taylor, who was doing it in the inaugural season, right? Making champions out of people that you wouldn't necessarily expect on paper. And, and they get the best, if you can get the best four fight or five fight, you know, streak of your career together, you're a world champion and a millionaire. That to me should be the narrative of following the PFL. Here, here's what, so my belief, once I started working for the PFL is that the PFL format should and has to be the star of the organization. Okay. Because you can't rely. This is not WWE where you could script out guys careers. You know, the guys that are selling the most merch that are best at cutting promos, you could extend and elongate and make them baby faces. You can make them heels. Right. And we've seen someone, uh, I'll give you, I'll actually ask you a question, which will help. Who do you think is the biggest star in the UFC? Currently, right now, I mean, I... yeah. First name that comes to mind. Who do you think? I'd say Connor. Still, yeah, it's Dana White. Okay. Yeah, that makes no. That makes sense. All right, and and the reason being is that if Connor never fights again, okay, the UFC is still going to be their brand. They're still going to move on. The PFL just showed that when everyone thought they were going to fold when Kayla Harrison left. Okay, Kayla is a world-class athlete. She's a generational talent. You don't find many like her in a lifetime, right? She still lost to Larissa Pacheco, showing she's still human. She had a couple of fights after that. And, you know, people are saying like, oh, they shouldn't do the format. Like there was a jet, there was a guy on Twitter who is a, he's a, he's a fan. He's knowledgeable, gave his opinion. And he was saying, oh, the PFL needs to get rid of the format and do rankings and do this. If they want to be like the UFC, my response was, they don't want to be like the UFC because there's one UFC. You keep trying to be the UFC, you're going to be out of business. You don't need to be the UFC to be successful. The PFL is trying to provide another option to fighters so it's not UFC or bust from a financial standpoint or a career standpoint. And you've seen guys like someone like Shane Burgos who left the UFC at the peak of his career and chose to go to the PFL. They offered him a better deal financially based on what he believed. And look what happened. He came in and he lost to OAM. He lost to Clay Collard, okay, which shows that the level of competition could surprise some people, right? For the PFL format, it's not just a Grand Prix because there's points involved. That's the whole point is to make that first round and second round more important than just a seasonal tournament. And what people need to understand, you got to really understand the format and the rules to have more of an appreciation. Otherwise, you're going in there and be like, oh, I don't know who these guys are. It's so boring. It's not what it's about, man. The PFL has fighters that can be stars no matter where they go. Dakota Dicheva is an obvious one, okay? You got this kid, Biagio Ali Walsh, the grandson of Muhammad Ali, that they literally brought him in as an amateur. You know, he had his first pro fight. Who knows where he goes, but this is someone who is a collegiate athlete, trains in extreme couture. You got another young kid in Thad Gene, who's a very young guy. This dude walks around like 210, somehow cuts to 170. Phenomenal athlete, you know, and then you have other fighters like Brett, like you can't tell me Brendan Lockman goes into the UFC tomorrow and wouldn't be top 10 in his division. Right. I, 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 I and, and people say like, oh, but he barely beat Kai Kamaka. Kai Kamaka is tough. Okay. Kai Kamaka who was in the UFC, right? Who was, <laughs> like... No, he wasn't top 10, <laughs> but, but Kai Kamaka was in the UFC when he was really young. This is not the same Kai Kamaka now who fought then. If you put Kai in the UFC now, 
way more successful and will give way more people trouble. And you know what people need to understand is that the UFC, I love the UFC. I love the PFL. There's room for both. You just, it doesn't have, as I mentioned earlier in the conversation, it doesn't have to be one versus the other. And with the format, to your point, it could create stars out of people you're not expecting. Look, Jesus Pinedo, okay, was in the UFC, didn't work out. His first round in the PFL, he lost to Braga by decision. Comes out and knocks out Lockney. Not, you know, knocks out what was it, whoever else. And then he got that he knocks out Braga. Went on this insane run, okay? People wanted to see him versus Pitbull in the Bellator versus PFL fight. Behind Clay Collard and Antonio McKee Jr., that was the second most voted fight that I saw on social media that people wanted to do. That came from the format, right? That doesn't happen anywhere else. The format gives you that opportunity. And it's very risky for guys like Brendan Lockney to fight necessarily some not well-known guys, but it also gives these not well-known guys or people who know who they are a chance to kind of get their number up, you know, get their name, like a guy like Mads Burnell, Okay. Round one, he lost, but yet he beats Clay Collard, and then he won his last fight. And he looked and he looked really good in in doing so. So I mean, it's um, it's just a it's an interesting situation when you just you know it's um how do I how do I say this? It, it, people just need to look at this from a different light and not compare it to the UFC. It, you know, the format makes it interesting. It gives these fights more purpose, maybe amongst people that you might not or not as popular. Right. But it gives that sense of urgency to get a finish. The PFL's trying to put on exciting fights as much as they can. But look, in the UFC, we had Francis Ngannou versus Derek Lewis. We all thought that was going to be the craziest fight of all time. And then there being the second worst fight of all time. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Is anyone saying the UFC sucks after that? Of course not. Right. Because it's not the, it's not Dana White's fault. If two guys go into a cage and decide that they are going to play, you know, patty cake and not fight. It's just how it is. So for the PFL, I love the format. I think they need to lean into the format as much as possible. I like to see a little bit of uh, a, diff a difference in how they do the matchups in rounds one and round two, right? So therefore, there's some relevance towards the seedings, the rankings, because you, you know, I'm sure you saw when that came about, you know, this year with some fights that got put together. But the PFL's got good people. You know, I can tell you that Don and Pete are very passionate about this and they're, they're great guys. They've treated me, dude, they've treated me so well. Every time I see them open arms, red carpet treatment, they're, they're the best. And they want this to be for the fans. They want, you know, and while being successful in business and remember the PFL is still relatively new. It's still relatively in its infancy and it's not at a point where changes can't be made for the better. Of course they can. I think the format though needs to be what built stars and they could still do their challenger series and have their contender series. You know, they had that for a while. That was how you got some, you know, some guys in there, but you know, people also, you know, someone like razor Rob Wilkinson, right. People didn't realize that he fought, what was it? Israel Adesanya and Adesanya's debut to a decision. Uh, Wilkinson then went on to win the championship. If you ask guys like Anthony Smith, who trains with Rob Wilkinson, he goes, he's one of the best guys in the world and people just may not realize it. So it's, you know, I know it's an uphill battle, and I, but when people like yourself ask me these questions, I, I do my best not have bias towards the company that I work on, work for, because I cover UFC as well, just as much, right? It doesn't have to be one over the other. It's just about how to find your place, how to be successful in a space that allows it, right? I love that there's multiple options, you know, and I'm, and I'm happy they kept Bellator alive also. I think there's a lot of room to grow with that brand. They have a lot of guys in that roster that are very, very good that we are not seeing as much as we want to. I can honestly say prior to PFL taking over, I didn't even sometimes know when Bellator cards were going on. You know, now it's a little bit more, you know, present. So I think the ownership group for the PFL and Bellator are, are, are looking to continuously grow, find ways to make it more fan friendly, but there's always going to be growing pains. But I urge people, whoever watches this and listens to what I have to say, Go into it understanding the format, not saying, oh, this is the B League to the UFC because there are guys from the UFC that went to the PFL and have not been successful. There are guys that are in the PFL that can go to the UFC. And I think I'm not saying they go in there and they're dominant champs. You know, you won't know till they get there, but there are a lot of guys in the PFL and Bellator that can go into the UFC and be just fine. At Ian Parker MMA on Twitter.
Also known as X. Where else can everyone find you? Uh, same thing on Instagram, Ian Parker MMA, although Twitter is really where I'm at. So if you guys ever have questions, want to tweet at me, by all means, uh, non-trolls only. I appreciate that. <laughs> you guys ever have any questions about betting or my opinions on anything, happy to make videos and answer or have the conversation. I, I love to give back as much as I can. And where, uh, what shows can everyone catch you on? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, ESPN, ESPN Best Bets can catch me there every single week with my co-host, Brett Okamoto, and with the PFL. Uh, Jonathan Coachman and I do betting the PFL podcast on ESPN Plus and then the pre-show prior to every single PFL fight as on ESPN Plus as well. So if you need to find me when it comes to the betting space, I am everywhere, my friend. Well, I appreciate you giving me all the time today. And I'm not just saying this because you're here. I'm saying this because I'm also <laughs> for him. Uh, you and Jonathan Coachman together is like my favorite duo of any oh, duo. Thank you. Uh, I have the utmost respect for both of you guys and Jonathan Coachman literally being uh, a part of my childhood and now adulthood. I'm uh, <laughs> a, a massive, massive fan of that guy. So I envy you on that side of things. Um, but man, thank you so much for the time. This is a great conversation. I've had so much fun. Sorry it took so many years for it to happen, um, but hopefully we'll uh, make this a little more uh, frequent because I, I really definitely had a, a great time talking to you. Mike, I appreciate it. Keep doing the good work, man. Thank you.